Did you know Vinted is Lithuania's first tech unicorn, but almost nobody thought it would work? I think the prevailing opinion at the time was it was too hard to build a pan-European marketplace. So how did they went from an almost failing business? At a certain point in time, it really went upside down to completely changing their business model. Bottom line, it comes down to you completely kill all your current revenue streams, build new ones, and then the last money that you have available, you blow it on television. <laughs> And now, they are Europe's largest online second-hand marketplace with a $3.5 billion valuation. And this is how they did it. Guys, I am so excited for this. I've been a fan of the Vinted business for years. Alex, I've been a fan of yours for years. I mean, you were last on the show five years ago. So first, thank you both so much for joining me today. Of course. Very happy to be here, man. Fan of your show. Great to be back, Harry, after so long. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to start with a bit of a weird one, but Thomas, I heard that you never intended to be the CEO. So can I ask, how did the opportunity actually come to be, given that as a starting point? Yeah, so I... Um... I got involved with with FJ Labs, and we 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 built a company there that we sold to um, uh, to Wallapop. Then we ran that for a while, and there you had investors uh, Insight and uh, Axel on the board. And then when we sold off to uh, Let Go, I was kind of like without a job, had nothing to do, uh, but I was really enjoying it. Living in New York, uh, was skating a little bit and thinking about what to do next. And actually, the plan was to build something again with Fabrice because, I don't know, me and Fabrice clicked and I was good. So then I had Elodie from Inside Ventures who came to me and said, Thomas, come for breakfast. I have this amazing company. You got to come. And I asked about the company and I kind of like really didn't look good. I'm like, come on, I'm not going to go to Lithuania while I live here in New York. And like, it's like no, I'm not going to do this. Another breakfast, another pitch of of uh, LOD, and I'm like, okay, I'll take a call. So I took a call with um, Mantas, Justus, and Vidas, and I remember these guys coming in, and they first told their stories about, you know, how they grew up in Lithuania, meaning growing up in the Soviet Union, like Soviet Union falls apart, like big chaos. These guys, brilliant, start building tech companies in Lithuania at the age of 13, 14, 15. Mantas built like a server company by himself that he sold. He was a data expert. Justus uh, built an accounting software in Lithuania that is still this day one of the most used accounting softwares in Lithuania. And Vidas was able to escape the Soviet because he was winning all these mathematics and uh, programming medals, you know, those Olympiadas. So I, I hear these stories of these guys and I'm like, holy shit, these are like brilliant guys i'm like okay i'm in new york or surrounded by a lot of like interesting people but like it would be really nice to meet them and then they showed me like how the business was doing they walked me through and you saw like fast growth of the business and then they changed the business model into what was let's say what the business model that poshmark is using as we speak and then the business started to collapse so they showed me this graph and they showed how at a certain point in time it really went upside down and i thought you know what I can learn a lot from this visit if I'm going to do this. So we closed the deal. I said, like, I need a consulting fee because I, I don't have any other job. I'll come help you five weeks. Write me a good check for five weeks and I'll come over for five weeks. And it just directly it connected. Like, um, I, I don't know. You sometimes have that with people who really understood each other. We started working. Within three weeks, we had a plan ready. And I sat down with Mantas and uh, Justus and Vidas. Well, actually, it was Mantas and Justus at that point in time. I walked them to this deck, like, 80 slides of analysis of how we should change the business model, what we should do. Bottom line, it comes down to you completely switch your business model. You, you practically kill all your current revenue streams, build new ones. And then the last money that you have available, you blow it on television. Meanwhile, <laughs> you also have to fire half of all the people, close all the offices except of Lithuania. So I ran through the plan and I thought like, okay, after this, they're going to send me back to New York and say, I'm going to find an easier way out. So they started asking questions, very detailed analytical questions. I was answering them. I was like, oh my God, they're actually very interested in this. And then they looked at each other and just someone looked at each other and were like, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think we should try it. Mantos was nodding, Just was nodding, said, okay, let's do it. I'm like... Well, you're actually going to do this and because it's like risking the whole company, right? These guys were building this for like five, six, seven years maybe already. And I was like, okay, you're really going to run this plan. And then I was like, okay, if I'm talking this talk, I got to walk to walk. So then I told them like, okay, I will help you pitch it to the board. And if they're really going to do it, I will just stay. You pay my Airbnbs and you pay my food and, let's, and let me help you execute on it. So then we executed on it um, in the months after 
and then uh, and then it worked and then we just we just kept on working kept on going and then i think it's nine months in before i actually had a real contract with vinted and they said like the guy you cannot go now and i was like okay i'm really enjoying <laughs> this stuff <laughs> that's uh, that's not the deal Alex, were you invested at this period? Or was this pre? Uh, this this was this was pre Lightspeed uh, investing. Think- we were aware of Vinted because um, a number of us had been involved in various resale companies before and various marketplaces before. And frankly, like I think the prevailing opinion at the time was it was too hard to build a pan European marketplace. Yeah. Like yeah, if, you, yeah. if you look if you looked at Europe at the time, there were there were sort of like sub regionally dominant companies. There was companies that were dominant in the UK or dominant in Germany or dominant in France. But the idea that you could build something that was truly pan European was a very controversial opinion and was not grounded in, in, in real data. And then on top of it, to, to Thomas's point, like they hadn't figured out the business model, they had figured out how to how to get a lot of people, you know, using the product and 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 in a sort of listings marketplace kind of way but they hadn't really figured out the solid business model so it was not well formed at the time i want to just ask on that thomas because you going specifically why did the business model break and go upside down and what did you do to turn it around as specifically as possible yeah it's practically the the value that the user gets out of it and the cost that you're asking so they were asking something in the tune of 15 to 20 percent seller fee which is like the standard thing that eBay and Poshmark were doing for years. But then in Europe, you had all these free classifieds where you could meet on the street, like Greg's List practically, and that's big in Europe. So they were launching this fee model while all the other also well-working platforms were practically giving higher liquidity at lower cost. So in practically the value proposition was inferior. So then that's where actually, that were the fundamentals where our research started. Okay, how can we create a value proposition that is superior to what it is in terms of liquidity and pricing, and then gives a lot more comfort in terms of safety, transactional services, everything that's there. And therefore we build it like these three revenue streams instead of only one revenue stream that enabled us to bring the cost of the transaction completely down and then generate extra cash out of other revenue streams. So practically economies of scope uh, created the ability to create a proposition. And when you made that transition, did you see the immediate impact in terms of the resurgence of the business? Yeah, so we did. We practically did A-B tests all around. So we had a lot of countries and we just throwed around different propositions for a couple of days in different countries and you immediately saw it. So practically price elasticity on the fee was determined in multiple countries. And then we kind of like, you can corner it out where you need to be with your fee. And then that was very low. <laughs> So it was quite scary. And and actually a a good uh, thing is like, yes, we did all the maths, but then we had Modestas, our, you know, the person who was leading product. And and he was like, we calculated it. And he was like, okay, this is probably the point, but let's be a little bit more safer. And we make it 5% plus 70 cents. And it was a bit of like a, well, let's just do it a bit higher. And a bit higher now, (laughs) 85% of our revenue. (laughs) <laughs> practically all the gross margin. So, so you know, there are a lot of lot of statistics, definitely, but also a bit of luck with that. That, that we priced it there, mm-hmm. obviously. You sound like a VC pricing their portfolio. <laughs> uh, 200, maybe 300. Yeah, let's go 300. Fuck it. Fundraising is coming. Uh, okay. And, and so we make those changes. Alex, talk to me then about how you reinteracted with the business. You said there about existing knowledge on the market. How did you and Thomas then build the relationship and just take me to that courting process. Yes. Yeah, so, so we had actually at the time, um, we had a number of partners at Lightspeed who had uh, interacted with Vinted at, at prior firms before they had joined uh, Lightspeed. Uh, one of them was actually Lithuanian. Um, yes. So there was actually, <laughs> there. Were, I mean, there, th- think about like how many Lithuanian VCs there are. It's, 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 there's not that many. And, and he, and he had a really strong relationship with, with the founding team and, and then with, with Thomas. And so the, we started to re-engage. We, we had, we had heard that this had been figured out and it was extremely counterintuitive for us investors because in the U S there's, you know, four or five. Um, relatively dominant resale marketplaces, you know, Thomas mentioned Poshmark, but there, but there, but there are others. And they all have, you know, s- supply side oriented, you know, business models. And so for us to hear that there was this company that essentially made it free to sell and kind of had this listings origin, but was layering on these sort of demand side fees was, was, was very counterintuitive. And at the time that it got resurfaced, 90% of the GMV was in France. Yeah. So the, 
the and France was going really well, but it was still ninety percent France in terms of GMV. What, so so we, why, why, why was that? Well, because, because you, we first really optimized for practically two years the business model to really make it work, and 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 then only we started expanding. And 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 think about this, right? Many of our investors were already very very happy that it was working in one country, and they were like, <laughs> "You really need to expand? Like th this is finally going well?" Because they went through like seven years of roller coaster. So so like you know, it was also we needed some um, some yeah, we needed some 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 how do you say it? A bit more track record to get there. Welcome to and your the, 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 the story. <laughs> the, the story we told ourselves was like, well, look, if you if you had this, if you had the gamble on like one market working, like you needed to be big enough that it matters, right? right? And you needed to have for fashion is like a really important part of the culture and economy, and it needs to be connected to a bunch of other re like countries that are that are nearby, so that if you win that country, you can tip other countries that are near via cross border. So France, France felt. Um, you know, like the right country there. And then, you know, the other obvious one would be the UK. But as Thomas can talk about, the UK took many, many, many years to get right. And it kind of wasn't working when we invested. So when we when we saw the business, you know, we were we were kind of betting on a lot on Thomas, <laughs> actually. I mean, we, we were incredibly impressed with what he was able to do in partnering with the founders. And at that point, he had become the CEO. Uh, yeah. And uh, the way the way we often talk about it is that it was almost like a refounding moment for the company, right? Can I, and, can, I, yeah. can I interrupt and ask on that one? Because, you yeah. know, I've known Thomas, obviously, at this point for years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, go back for a long time, yeah. Go back a long way. Uh, but, like, you know, respectfully, we hail as VCs, founder-led businesses, right or wrongly. To what extent did that, hang on, it's not actually a founder-led business, and Thomas is a CEO who's incredible, but has been brought in. Did that factor into discussions? I mean, Thomas, when we talked to the founders of the company, it became pretty clear that Thomas was as close to a founder of this company as you can be without actually being there at the very beginning. And I, I, I believe that companies can have these refounding moments where, where a, a really um, outstanding individual comes in with the right set of skills for a given moment in time and takes a company on a, on a, on a different trajectory. So in my, in my view, there's like, some people that have this discrete version of like, oh, so-and-so, you had to be there on day one. You had to own like, I don't know, 10% of the company on day one to be qualified as a founder. And then there's a spectrum. And there's people who, and Harry, you may have some in your portfolio who are like, maybe they weren't there on day one, but they joined within the first year and they've been critical to the business. They've, they've invented some product that transformed the company. And so I think of, you know, Thomas joining Vinted in roughly 2016-ish as being a pivotal moment for the for the company and 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 the fact that the founders eventually said to him you should be the ceo i think is as big of a vote of confidence as you can get when as a vc you asked the question if everything goes right what could this be when you were discussing this and internally making that decision what was the discussion if vintage goes right what is vintage there were a number of differing points of view on this um, I think it's very easy to look at a business and say what they do today is how big can that thing be? And that's going to be the base case return for a later stage investment. So we had that discussion and we said, well, how, how big is resale? Resale is really big. It's, it's, it's actually a lot of people think resale could be 20% of all apparel by 2030. So, you know, at a macro level, if we just did resale, if we just focused on Peer to peer, selling other people's clothing to each other, we could we could probably be a ten billion dollar company. I think I think the math pencils out. But you need to believe that, that that's a pan European company. So you need to believe that this company does something that almost no one's been able to do, and actually use the sort of lead they have in France to catalyze an ecosystem that that, that goes across Europe. And the thing that we saw in the business when we really dug in was that that that, that Thomas and his team have been able to drive shipping costs down to the point where they were often the, the very cheapest option. And that this was a key strategic lever to not only winning countries, but to like extending between countries. And our theory of the case was that that was going to be the strategic weapon that we use to sort of roll up the entire region. That by being the sort of cheapest shipping rails in e-commerce, for starting with apparel, but eventually other things, that we'd actually be one of the first to build a pan-regionally dominant company. So then if you believe that, <laughs> then you start to talk about companies, you know, if you look at regions around the world that have a dominant marketplace, including the U.S. Um, with eBay back in the day, 
there are other things you can do. Payments businesses. There's other things that you can build on top of a highly engaged community of tens of millions of people transacting with each other. And so we said, that's the lottery ticket. That's the thing that if we get it right, could have what we call unbounded upside. But first, what we have to do is we have to solidify France. We have to, we have to, we have to use the sort of shipping cost advantage to deepen into these other countries. And at some point win the UK and, you know, whatever, five years later, a lot of that's been done and that foundation has been set up. Thomas, I'm about to pepper you with questions, but, and don't be offended by this answer from Alex, no, but no, Alex, no. internally, if you guys marked the one reason why Vinted wouldn't work, what was that reason? I would say the one reason Vinted wouldn't work at the time when we talked about it, we said, well, if we look back, you know, five years from now and this didn't work out, why did it not work out? The pre, the pre-mortem on this decision, right? It's hmm. probably because France was a unique thing yeah. that, that, that there was something unique about France. They, because it was very clear they had won France at that point in time. And it was, and France was, was, was the, like, it was a profitable region, right? So it was, it was clear that that was working, but the, 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 the con was like, yeah, but that's, that's a unique thing. France is unique for all these reasons. People in France like fashion a lot. Like that's not going to work in other places. Just to highlight this, this was the, this was a general thought. Like, like people said, like France is just special. The Bouquin is a special company. People were saying, just share your data with uh, Wallapop, help them out because like, you're never gonna go to Spain, just build something beautiful in France. And internally we were like, hell no, we're gonna sharpen this tool. We're gonna sharpen this tool. And when we go out, we'll show it works. But it was absolutely 2018, two years after turnaround, Still, that was the prevailing thought, right? Well, you have a nice business in France. So that was the prevailing thought. It could have just been a dominant French business. Yeah. But it wasn't. And it wasn't because of the international expansion. And so I want to discuss that and understand that you've shown that your ability to build market share in now multiple geos from start. It's a really shit question, so I'm really sorry for asking it. But how did you broach the chicken and egg problem of a new part marketplace in a new country? Yeah, I think it's it's an uh, um, it all comes down to focusing on what's causal driver of success. And and when you when you look at Vinted, it's it's purely that you create successful buyers and sellers. So so the seller needs to become successful, then he comes back becomes a buyer. So you really need to ensure that you build success for the people that come to your platform. So that means that the conversion rates are, are high and that there are multiple drivers behind that. So the first one obviously is that your recommendation engines are working well so that the right buyers see the right content. So that's basic fix number one. Number two, very, very important is that all the negative effects are mitigated. So that's really ensuring that all the security, trust and safety stuff is, is in place. And then the third element is practically that all the things that facilitate the transaction are completely seamless. So shipping, payments, the wallet, the transaction, everything. So those are practically your hygiene factors. And then you need to have an ability to kind of like see around the corner in terms of how you're going to deploy your marketing investments. And there you have to be in the beginning, you have to be a bit brave. So you have to practically map out for yourself. If, if I can get to this point, then that means I can, we'll have that efficiency. And from there, I can grow to here where I'll have this profitability, which gets into kind of forecasting magic that is not exactly a science anymore, right? And thus you need to believe that there's a certain market and then go in with a certain amount of investment to get to your first milestones at a certain efficiency. But that first big investment is always a risk. But because we walked France through all these milestones and we really like fine-tuned that process, we then had a lot of confidence in making those investments because the predictions of these new markets could be tracked by the historical trends of France. So, so by staying long in France, we walked France through all these investment scenarios and thereby we had a playbook that we then ruthlessly could roll out in all the other countries and make upfront investments that look like nuts to people. So I think up to 2020, 2019, most of the industry was just waiting until we would go bankrupt because they thought like, this doesn't make any sense. And, but they didn't believe our economics would make sense. They didn't believe that you could spend that amount of money and it would come back to you. 
so Thomas, when you're a pro podcaster, you'll really get professional note taking when someone speaks. <laughs> uh, but I was writing things uh, that I really wanted to double click on. You said about like uh, recommendation driven for on the buy side. Yes, I'm intrigued. How much do you want it to be demand search driven versus recommendation driven on the buy side? And what does that look like today? Yeah, so people come with a certain intention usually. And then they start clicking. So in that moment, the, 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 the software needs to ensure that next to, let's say, the most relevant results, you also get other recommendations. So when you look at, um, like look at Vintage, you'll see a feed that has, when you search for something, you get specifically what you want. But then when you go, for example, to the item, to the item you also see what other items this user has. So you have, let's say, a mix of the both. And that really works because then people are inspired to also look at other things that, that person has. And very likely when you are liking a certain sweater that a person has, this person probably has a certain style that you like and probably the other items that they have are relevant but random in terms of what you were searching for. So it is a mix of both that you need to uh, need to uh, address. And, and I just wanna add one subtle point on this because Harry, like recommendations are, are even more critical in resale than they are in, in, in new. And the, and the reason is every item that you have on a resale site is unique. Um, in, in a lot of, in a lot of cases it is sometimes you'll, you'll find power listers who will list a lot of things, but like if you had this thing where you have only one of everything, well, definitionally you have to actually serve more recommendations to that user in the same session to get them to, to transact. Cause they're not going to go really deep in a catalog of a hundred SKUs. They want to go kind of shallow in a catalog of 10,000 SKUs. So that's like a really, really hard user interface problem. And what it requires is building an app that's really fun. Because if the app's really fun to browse and window shop in, people will spend a lot of time in the session and they'll have the opportunity to, to see things as they, as they browse. And so the fundamental user experience is different. When we, when we looked at Vinted in 2019, it had social media-like time spent in the yeah. app. And that was a really unusual thing for shopping because in shopping, usually you usually want to show up, buy something, and leave. That's not what people do in Vinted. No. How do you, I, I, I want to dig into that, but I do also want to dig into how do you define a retained seller? At what point do you have real confidence of their returning desire? Is it when they sell three items, five items, 10 items? What's that signal? Well, obviously the spectrum of probability goes up as transactions increase, but um, uh, practically the first two transactions are the most important. Okay, so the first two transactions are the most important. Uh, totally get that. When you think about the, the markets that you've entered now, which one didn't go to plan and what did you learn from it? I mean, like the reality is, is that many things didn't go to plan, right? So uh, like it, the story from a outside looks like, okay, they had France, then they went Belgium, then they went easily to Spain, then the Netherlands. That looks like a very smooth, well thought through story. But the reality was we actually first tried the proposition in Germany and that went like, okay, okay, okay. And then we kind of had board approval that we you know, could test also in other things. And we saw France go, we did the case and then we thought, let's just go. We're not gonna wait for the next board meeting. They kind of gave the direction approval and we tried France and it took off. So it started already with one failure and then France came. Then after France went, can I just ask, why did Germany fail? Because uh, we, we, we believe that in Germany, the shipping infrastructure is different than it is in, in France. So that really didn't help. Uh, mm. so, so France, we had this beautiful company, Mondial Real, that really wanted to work with us, really gave us good prices, really helped us. And both of us, Mondial Real and us, we magically grew together. It was really a symbiotic uh, uh, collaboration. If you look at France, why it took off, that relation with Mondial Real, the relation with Mango Pay, both of these French companies believed in us, gave us good contracts and worked very closely with us. And then the marketing pricing in France was favorable. So those three things together helped us to do that. And then, then we got really excited and I was like, okay, let's just test some, uh, some stuff in the UK and the US, which horribly failed. And we're like, okay, let's get back to let's get back to focus. And then why we, did that? Why did why did they fail? Yeah, I mean, if I knew, then uh, we would have a working uh, <laughs> model now in the US. But I think mostly, like if you look at the product vintage in France, 2016, 2017, January 2017, we launched the new proposition. 
that product is like a hundred times worse than what we have right now. And, and we were lucky that this worked in France and that we then took, I think it's very good that the US and the UK gave like horrible numbers after some marketing tests there, that we really started to focus to make Vinted France really, really work well. We said, okay, let's just really go into the details. Everything must be better. Customer support, recommendations, shipping costs, payment costs. We, like two years, we were like grinding, grinding, grinding. And then we said, okay, let's go Belgium. And then that was because Mondial Relais said, you know, we actually have a network in Belgium as well. Do you want to go there? It will be very easy with shipping. And then we said, okay, we have confidence now. Let's do it. And then Belgium went quite easy. Um, but, but yeah, so, so along the way, many failures and many failed launches. Like the UK took, I don't know if it's six or five times before it worked. And the last time, I mean, Alec, you were, you were by then in the board. It was like, Thomas, really? Again, the UK? <laughs> Like, you know that Depop is there. You're not going to win this market. I mean, come on. But but I just want to understand, like, why did it work the sixth time when it didn't work the prior, prior, fucking hell, prior five times? Yeah, so I think we always want explanations that are kind of like binary. We fix this and then then it, then it worked. Yet, if, if you look at an ecosystem of Vinted, it is a multi, multivariate system. So even within Vinted itself, you have all these factors like uh, the different type of buyers, the different regions. Then you have the sh different shipping companies, the different payment companies. Then you have outside factors, which is like your competitors, uh, the fashion macro trends, all these kind of things. So there are many, many things that have impact. So you never know exactly which of these things had the most impact. So. The things that I know that we really, really improved on in the last time when we went into it is that we really improved our shipping proposition. We fixed a couple of fundamental things within payment. And then what we were very lucky with is that COVID opened a window of opportunity, that the marketing prices went down, people went more online. And then we actually saw that our improvements that we did before gave some organic growth. And then we felt bullish enough to put money behind that. And then it really took off. And then we just... Then when we saw those numbers, we saw like, hey, now it fits our market face model. And then we just, then we went all in, like the whole company just focused and just go in. I think there's one other factor as well, which is more of a macro thing, but the end of zero interest rates benefited us a lot. I remember when early when I, when I joined the board, it was still, we're still in this era of like insane discounting by some of our competitors in various regions. And we had to make these hard choices. Like, do we, do we match the discounts? Do we you know, how, how how hard do we really compete for this territory knowing this is less profitable? That all went away pretty quickly um, post the, sort of the COVID uh, fears of recession and inflation. And then with the, with the interest rates going up again, and, you know, I, I think it's like one of these things where when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. And the fact that we have had a great business model that, that we could port over there um, allowed us to, to sort of take that, take that ground at that time. And I think we were very scared. So Depop got sold to Etsy and we yeah. were shitting our pants. Like I thought Josh Silverman is going to like take a bit baseball bat and smash us into the ground because Etsy is a company I very much look up to. They're a great company. Josh is a great CEO. And I thought like, okay, we're fried. If we, if we don't win now in, in, in the UK, we're, we're done. We're over. Like Thomas, you can go back to, to the Netherlands and this was a nice ride, but uh, see you later. Was the UK a bet the boats decision or was it not? Because you tried it so many times. I mean, respectfully, it seems like a two-way door though. Yeah, yeah, of course. But like at that point in time, can you imagine like one of your big competitors gets bought by Etsy, which looks to us at that point in time, a company with infinite amount of resources, an incredible, you know, technology team from the Silicon Valley. Like, I mean... And then you're sitting there in, 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 in like Lithuania with 200 developers and, and like a little bit of money on your bank account. It's like, yeah, you're scared. So, so yes, two-way door, but like maybe after this year, it might no door at all anymore, you know? So that, that, that was the feeling there, as well on the team. There, there's two-way door decisions, but like even two-way door decisions that are important require a lot of management bandwidth and capital and time commitment. And, mm -hmm. and we, we, I, think, I think like the conversation I remember having was, if we want to build a pan-European dominant peer-to-peer -peer marketplace business, 
we have to get the UK. And there's no reason we shouldn't get the UK. So we just got to figure it out. And, and I think, I think it was just that persistence versus other, some other ideas that, that I think came up. We were like, do we really need to do that? Like, is that existential for us that we have to do that? Whereas the UK is like, no, we have to do this. So I totally get you. And I was, I was planning on discussing competition later, actually, but you know, the stories of conversation is it changes and is fluid. Uh, I'm worried about Timu and Shine. I'm worried about Timu and Shine because I'm going to get killed for this. And, you know, I, I, I don't even, yeah, hopefully people don't know where I live, but like the amount of advertising dollars they are spending yeah. is egregious. I mean, yeah. they are funding meta in a, a lot of cases. Um, how do you compete? In a world of endless capital supply for ad dollars against Sheen, Shine, whatever they're called, or Timu? Well, I think for Vinted specifically, um, Timu, Shine are spending money to attract buyers. And every Timu, Shine buyer can become a Vinted seller. And we're spending money to attract sellers of secondhand clothing. So for us, we're kind of like, just out of that storm like so so that storm just passes us and actually gives a whole new bunch of inventory that can be sold on on vintage so yes we see it a little bit but that is not something that really dramatically impacts our growth at this point in time does it not impact the ad dollars you're able to spend in terms of the effectiveness of those no, because, dollars because they really search for the buyers so so they have the content and they need to get the buyers we need to get the content so it's not that if somebody, uh, you know, bought Shine, it's not going to be buying us anymore. So it's it's it, in 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 that sense we we're not suffering from it, but it, it's obvious that uh, that that companies who are directly competing with them, it's it's incredibly difficult. So yeah, we're just protected by that. Our positioning is different. I, I also think of like the value proposition for resale is very different than what they're offering. I mean, they're really competing against H and M and. Uh, a lot of fast fashion Zara, like the fast fashion companies. Where I'm just going to put. I'm just going to put this out here. I'm going to be an Ackman. If I can be an Ackman, uh, and no, I'm not talking about plagiarism. I'm going to throw a short out there for Boohoo and ASOS. Oof, I would not like to be them. It's hard. Um, it, it's it's hard if you're if you're in the. Fa I think fast fashion is getting reinvented right now by by these guys. But the thing about resale and the, and one of the reasons it's attractive is that you're getting very cheap price relative to the quality of the goods that you're getting. It's it's actually a great way to buy high quality brands that that you love that you already wear for 80, 90% off, and that's not a value proposition that Shein and Temu are are selling. Right. So in, in some ways. It, it's it's actually an orthogonal thing, as Thomas said, um, but it's definitely a problem for you know, the fa online fast fashion retailers. Yeah, and if if you look at let's say the rise of these companies, everybody talks about let's say the cheap, um, like the amount of money they spend on marketing, but actually when you look at the fundamentals that completely changed the fashion industry over let's say the last hundred years, then it's actually the people who consistently found new levels of efficiency in production and shipping. So the non-obvious is that shipping is actually what is really, really important here. So these companies have completely renovated how fast they produce and how fast they're able to deliver from China and Turkey into Europe and the US. And, and that's actually, if, if you look at what let's say the Zaras and the Zalandos did, they did that to the previous companies and the previous companies did that to the previous companies before. So it's, it's, it's not only like, there's a lot of focus on the marketing approach because that is in your face, but this marketing approach is possible because the underlying dynamics of the infrastructure that they've built is actually allowing them to spend that money on marketing. How are they? I bought on Timu for the first time the other day. Yeah, um, me too. A, a Bluetooth speaker that I don't fucking need, and a pair of gloves that have some electronic warmer in it that I don't fucking need either. And it came in <laughs> to about eleven pounds. Uh, <laughs> whoa, whoa. How are they able to do delivery for free? I, I so I really don't get that. Well, there is one thing with Europe that I know is that there is a loophole that if you send in a package under one hundred and fifty euros, it's not taxed, and therefore, for example, companies like Zalando are actually having higher prices to send a package from Germany to Belgium than they have from China to Belgium. I got you. Well, you know, 
Europe regulates better than anyone else. So we'll, we'll get to that, my friend. <laughs> uh, can, can I ask you, what's the ran, totally weird and random one? But actually, first, how, we talked about like the difference between resale and you know what Shine and um, Timu do. How do you think about breadth versus depth in each new geo? That's a really difficult decision. The type of marketplace that we are, we are two-sided network effect marketplace, buyers and sellers, two sides. And the bigger we become, the more valuable the marketplace becomes. So you clearly see more listings. The more listings you have, the faster you sell those listings. So for us to get a, bit, a model working in a country, it is crucial to get the depth because that's driving the, the network effects. And thereby we go practically in Europe, region by region, creating these working two-sided marketplace and then moving on to the next. And that not only goes for, let's say, a country, it also goes for a category. So also within our categories, depth is the most interesting thing. So I would say in our business, two-sided network effect, depth is what drives the fundamentals to then go wider. Can I ask on that, when we think about the different regions that you've expanded into, what is the ramp time to profitability within each region? And how do you think about that maturation period to get to a good place economically in each region? Yeah, so it gets faster over time uh, for us. Um, and it depends. It, it also depends how aggressively you want to go. So there are certain times that you say, well, at this size, I feel good and safe about my economics to take it a bit slower. And then, you know, you hit profitability earlier. Uh, but if there are more competitive situations, it takes longer. But it can be as fast as 12 months and it can be as long as uh, three years. Alex, to your you know, position on the board, when you think about and have that discussion, honestly, to what extent are you, are you like, you know what, fuck it, we're happier to win the market and be less profitable for longer than let's be super disciplined and get to profitability as soon as possible. How do you weigh that at the board? There's a few different levels of the analysis that we take into account. One is sort of the marginal transaction, right? So what are the unit economics on a marginal transaction? Is that a profitable? The second is at a country level, which is the question you just asked, how long is it going to take us to sort of get in the money at the country level? And it should be getting easier and easier over time because we have cross-border network effects. We have lower shipping rates across Europe. We have more brand awareness, more inventory in different countries. So it should get faster. And the third level is at the company level, you know, including all your operating expenditures. How, what's the efficient frontier you're spending at? And the tricky thing about marketplaces is that you cannot grow arbitrarily fast. There is an efficient frontier that, that you want to hit where you can balance supply and demand and fulfill a high quality experience for both sides of the marketplace. And if you, and so I think what one thing Thomas's team is really, really good at is figuring out quantitatively where are we on the efficient frontier for a given country. And that's the rate at which we're scaling. We have plenty of capital on our balance sheet. So we have to burn more, we'll burn more, but we want to prioritize being at that efficient frontier. And it turns out that if you do that, you create a very healthy company because what happens is the older geos start to produce cash flow that cover the newer geos. And then there's a trade-off of like, we're not raising venture capital anymore. We're looking at our cash flow and saying, how do we want to invest that cash flow next year? And what's the portfolio of investment opportunities? And what's the time period over which those investments pay off? And we're trying to balance some short-term and some very long-term investments. And that's the, that's the discussion we have at the board. Yeah. Yeah. The old note taking comes out again. You mentioned the efficient frontier. Have you mm -hmm. ever got where you are on the efficient frontier wrong? And why did you get that wrong analysis? Well, I, I could talk about Vinted and I can talk about in general because we have a lot of companies at Lightspeed where we have to make this judgment. I think we have something like four or 500 companies globally that we're investors in at this point. One of the biggest errors in judgment on the efficient frontier is when you're you're attributing a lifetime value to a set of users that turns out to be wrong. The thing you know in the short term is your payback period, kind of. But if you're making judgments as to like, well, this is going to be a, a user that pays off three to one or four to one, and the retention doesn't play out the way you thought it did, you can be in a bad spot. And the 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 reason this is a really relevant question you just asked is we just came out of COVID, and I guarantee you, if you look at any consumer company in 2020 and 2021 their cohorts look fundamentally different than they did in 2022 and 2023. They just performed different. People were adopting new behaviors. A lot of those behaviors did not stick. And a lot of projections at the end of 2021 going into 2022 before the collapse were based on cohorts that, that just were not the real thing. 
And that caused a lot of this sort of misses to plan in 2022 and excess cash burn. So you got to be really confident that what your projections uh, on a cohort basis are going to be are accurate. Um, and the more conservative way to, 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 to do it, to think about the efficient frontier, is just to look at it on a payback basis and to look at it on a cash flow basis. But, you know, the trade off to that is you're less aggressive and you might miss some long term opportunities. So it's all about that discussion. Like, is this real? How confident do we feel? Why do we feel so confident? How repeatable is this? And it's, it's a judgment call at the end of the day. I think it's very important to build a growth framework that has all these things together in the stages of growth of each of the countries so that you constantly kind of check yourself, well, on a lifetime value, on a payback this, on a cash flow that, does it all still make sense so that you take context of all these elements and that you really stay very clear to yourself about what are predictive values and what are actually real truths. Because like certain predictive values, like if you look at LTV over five years time, it's like, okay, we hope that this is gonna be there. But like, oh, see, this is predictive value. It's not a real value. What's the actual payback now? How much did we earn? What is our cash flow? What is our burn? Yeah, you need to see all these numbers in context. It's like, like if you look at these businesses, these marketplaces, multivariate models. So if you're going to steer your whole marketing investment on one metric, like a cost per or a certain payback, then like you're by definition, you're wrong because all these variants are moving around and you need to like control them all. Just to give you one, just one more really tangible example in case your, your, your listeners are interested. I mean, early on in a company's life in a marketplace business, one of the fundamental things like never changes across all marketplaces is that more liquidity generates higher and more inventory generates higher conversion rates. But there's, there's diminishing returns on that, right? Um, because the user can only see so much inventory in a given session. So early on, you're nowhere near that efficient frontier. And as you're, as you're growing the inventory in your marketplace, it looks like your conversion rate could be going up linearly. And you're like, this is great. I'm just going to add more and more and more. We're going to invest linearly in more inventory. But then you hit that diminishing return. And so if your plan was that it was going to be linear forever, well, hey, you're, it's going to be wrong and you're going to disappoint. And a lot of the times you have to even refactor the entire search experience, refactor the discovery experience so that you can expose more of that inventory to your users and reclaim a new efficient frontier for conversion. So these are the kind of things that happen from a product standpoint that, that, that matter with respect to what you're asking. I am perpetually stuck on CAC. <laughs> and that's why I was single for many years, chaps. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but what I mean by that is like, you know, when you acquire your first users, in some ways it's cheaper because they're the most hardcore fans. They feel the need and the pain more than ever. But then in some ways, and so you think, okay, they're the cheapest and they'll get more expensive over time as that core saturates. But then you also go, well, you also have that trade-off of then you have increased brand awareness, you have increased word of mouth, you have network effects. Do customers get cheaper or more expensive to acquire over time from your perspective? I think it's very important to define exactly uh, what, what customers are. So if if you would say it from a blended cock and payment, uh, cock and payback, then absolutely should become cheaper over time. Like th these blended paybacks are just going down over time because you're your organic goes up, your motor vehicle goes that, that absolutely needs to come. But I think the, the story of direct impacted uh, by marketing new listers, sellers, buyers, whatever you want to call it, uh, as the marketplace matures, you're going to have at a certain point in time a large share of the population and thus it, it becomes harder. So therefore, it's very, very important to consistently really look at the marginal cost and not the average cost of all your cock. Because that's also a very, very big mistake, right? You can say, I have a cock of this. Okay, nice. But what is, let's say, your first 100,000 euros spent, your second 100,000 euros spent, your third 100,000 euros spent, the cock in each of these is, is, is wildly different. And that's usually a curve that goes like this. So I think averages are very uh, uh, dangerous to steer on. And thus you need to always look at distributed values of like the marginal additional cost of what you bring in. Did you mispredict because of inaccurate cohorts due to COVID? We did not uh, because like we got quite a boost to it. And we know that we have this summer effect and these autumn effects. And we see just in summer, people go to the beach and then they're buying a lot less. It's, it's very obvious. And then autumn comes, weather changes, people are starting trading again and whoop, all the metric goes up. So we saw kind of like, People were locked up in the rooms and we saw a bit of a boost due to that. And it was very clear, like it's because of that. 
So, and what we also knew was like, at a certain point in time, these people are gonna go out again into the parks and enjoy their lives. So we were actually very scared of like the after COVID dip and thereby we predicted quite conservatively and therefore we were in a good place. But I think in Lithuania, we have a very paranoid mindset. It's a country that's been run over by the Soviets, the Germans, and like, it, you know, if you live between Kaliningrad, Belarus and Latvia, you, you kind of like are always aware that maybe something goes wrong. And, and thus, like when things go really well, you're kind of like, okay, this feels too good to be true. Let's be very careful. You mentioned cash cow earlier. I think, Alex, you did, like in regions becoming cash cows and then being able to fund subsequent regions and subsequent uh, projects. Which region is the biggest cash cow today? I think without giving away too much. Uh, Europe. I, I, <laughs> Europe. No, I, think, I think it's very logical. Like we see all countries moving at the same trend. Older the country, the, the more it contributes in terms of free cash flow. That's practically, and then it's obviously it's correlated to the population. So the older a country, the bigger a country, the more cash flow comes out of it. That that's an old, I mean old, as in us entering. So yeah, that I, I I'm not gonna specifically name things, but that that's how it works. I totally get that. Uh, can I ask the other thing is like when choosing like new markets, what are these like top one or two things? And Alex, do chime in here too because like boards are very significant in terms of deciding where to go. What are the top one or two markets? You mentioned Belgium earlier, and I was like, why why is he even going to Belgium? And you were like, oh, the transport, and that was why, and like shipping, and so it makes it. What are the core determinants? that decide why you choose a market as attractive or not? So we try to reason from probability of generating success as in euro values. And if all probabilities in every country would be the same, then you would just start with the biggest country. Yeah. Yet that's not, not the case. So the equation is a product of probability of success and the size of a country. And then probability of success is defined by practically the level of competition, the level of development of infrastructure in shipping, in payments, uh, and maturity of e-commerce market. And based on such variables, you then come to a probability that you are going to be successful. Then you rank those probabilities of success times the value of the market in a little Excel, and then you have your prioritization. When we are talking about France, second margin market, Belgium, it was just the first time we were after a long time focusing on France, we're going out and we said, let's just take a market that is the easiest. And thus we took Belgium, kind of to warm up and have the lowest probability of failure. So we first went for a couple of safe bets and then we started to rank it as it is. Alex, what does it look like at the board level? Because boards want growth, boards need growth. Yeah, we'd normally push and go, come on, UK, come on, US. Like, we got to get the next round. <laughs> Well, I think the thing to grok is that, you know, fashion industry is one and a half trillion dollars globally. You know, it's many hundreds of billions of dollars in Europe, and you know, resale has grown from you know one percent of the market when vintage started to probably ten, fifteen percent of the market today, and it's on its way to twenty percent. So, you don't need to have that many people to have a sizable business, but obviously, it matters the scale you're at. So, the scale vintage was at in twenty nineteen, Benelux was actually a reasonably sized marginal opportunity to go. It could actually make a difference. As we got bigger, it became things like, like the UK and Italy and Spain that you had to go, you had to go in and eventually Germany. And then over time, as you start to become dominant there, you start to not just think about growth in terms of adding people and the single, you know, transactors, but adding entire share of closet is the term we use. Um, you know, how you get more of the stuff that is in that person's closet and how you expand into new categories. And so there's different ways to think about layering in TAM, but there, at Lightspeed, when we think about addressable market, we don't really think about it in dollars first. We think of it as surface area. We think of it as like, how, what is the surface area we're gaining access to here uniquely in our strategic wedge? Because if you look at some of the best businesses, they've been able to take their surface area and continue to build and build and build on top of it. And that's actually where the TAM comes from. Alex, sorry, to, what, what is surface area? How do you guys think about that? Surface area is, is, is the sense of like, you might have 10 million customers, but only 1% of their clothing is being transacted. But you know, in the industry broadly, it's a fi it's 15% of all apparel is sold in, in resale. So therefore, if I have 1%, when I start five years from now, am I going to have 15 
20, 30 percent of that person's closet? Because if so, that's like an order of magnitude expansion at the customer level. So what really matters is not getting 30% of their closet at the beginning. It, it matters that you can land with that customer and then expand through them through their share of closet in this case. And so the surface area, meaning the, the number of people you can touch, the number of people who experience the problem you're solving, is actually a lot more important as a leading indicator of TAM versus the actual final TAM when all is said and done. Got you. So you actually want that chasm to be greater between where we are now and that surface area. Because if you were at twenty percent and the standard was fifteen, you're like, actually, maybe weighted. We're already ahead. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, like it would be great if you could land with thirty percent of of their stuff. It's just you're probably not going to be ahead of what the market average is. You're probably going to be less. And it's nice that almost every company actually grows into that. So I know you know you do a lot of enterprise investing as well, Harry, and like you know you're often thought about. Okay, well I'm going to land at 50k ACVs, but I really want to get to 20, you know, 200,000, 300,000, million dollar ACVs. The same the same thing exists in consumer. You know, it's it's you know I want to get that customer. I want to get them to transact. I want to have a good payback period on that acquisition. But what I'm really going for with that customer is much, much larger than that initial set of transactions. I do want to discuss Europe. You know, Thomas, Europe is a tough spot right now, I think. Yeah. And you said before how hard Europe is losing. Yeah. I agree. Why is Europe losing in your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard, right? I ask myself this question a lot and I, I'm it actually makes me anxious because, I mean, as a continent, you need great companies that generate a lot of jobs and pay taxes to build highways and, and hospitals and institutes to train society. And it scares me a lot when I see that, like, like the statistics about value we create versus what the U.S. is doing. It's, it, it really is, is difficult to see. I don't know what it is exactly, but there are a couple of things that are quite different. Like, for example, in, in, in the Netherlands, if I'm back at home, I love my friends. They're, they're amazing people. But when I'm around them, it always feels like I'm an enormous workaholic. And and uh, people are telling me, like, come on, dude, like, take it a step slower and, like, take uh, Fridays off and, uh, I don't know, start do uh, whatever. And when I'm in New York or when I'm in Silicon Valley and I'm surrounded by people like Alex and the people there, I feel like I'm the lazy guy. So there, there, there's <laughs> definitely a difference in between, like, uh, because you you know, the work ethics is very different. And I think Lithuania is a bit of an exception because it's a very young country. They really want to build themselves up, want to prove themselves. So there's a very strong work ethic there. Therefore, I feel very much at home in Lithuania. Um, but like in Europe, this work ethic is different. Uh, I think we have it very well. Things are arranged very well and thereby people are enjoying life more, which is not a bad thing, but like longer term, it might have very bad impact on our on our continent. So I think that's one. And then... Two, I think in terms of regulations, I, I think we're failing uh, to, to stimulate the companies that we need to build for the future are not able to tax, you know, Chinese and American companies in the right way. And thereby, you know, our ability to practically extract value out of the economy to pay our society, which is what tax should do, is, is failing to a certain extent. So our flywheel starts to slow down. The motivation is less, the extraction to stimulate uh, is less and then the fly will go slower so it's it's something i think is very sad and i worry about it it's it's not good i know i i listen dude i deeply fucking worry about it i you know i live in london i bet my career on europe i, I didn't move to america when i could have done and so I, I share your concern i guess my question is subsequently and the uk i think is particularly bad you know we can thank ourselves for you know regulating figma but my point being what can we do about it like when we think about the taxation policies towards US, China, other nations outside of the EU, and when we think about regulatory on M&A comp competition, what could we do to change it and what would you suggest? I think there are two elements in this. It is our own behavior as CEOs and for-profit companies to uh, show the way in how we can be constructive for society. So it's building fair companies to a certain extent that give their fair value to society in terms of taxation, in terms of kind of revenues back go into society, and, and that, that all helps to, 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 to support society. So actually, as a company, be grateful for the society that allows you to build there. Because then, if you do that, you're in a position that, I don't know, governments and society will trust you. So then when you will signal that certain things are harmful not good for society, not good for your business or uh, the economy, 
then there will be trust and there will be listened to and then act upon, I think. So I think it's important to show as a company that you have the best intentions and also showing it by doing it in the right way and then getting trust from governments and then have an open, transparent conversations with governments to help them to structure it. Because it's not that these people in politics are like, oh, let's build some uh, nasty regulations to bring this continent down. Like they're trying really to do their best and it's a complex job. And I think only if we collaborate with high integrity with each other, we can get there because it's complex. Like, it, I, I don't know exactly what the silver bullet is, but that's the only way out, I think. I think you have a, a nicer view of the regulation environment than me. Uh, but uh, I'm going to just hold back there because Alex, light speed of an office in Europe now. And I was chatting to an investor who will re remain unnamed because he's a buddy of mine, but he was like, dude, why are you in Europe? Like you've had like Adyen, you've had Spotify, Revolut's not liquid yet, but it will be in that ilk. But that's it. Like, come on. Well, so we actually have multiple offices in Europe, uh, which is, uh, so it's even, we're even crazier by your, by your logic, Harry. Uh, we, you know, uh, we have a, a lot of folks in London, but we also have a partner in, in, in Paris and another partner in Berlin. And We've made investments in probably half a dozen European countries in the last few years, uh, maybe even maybe even more. And we've always been, you know, investing in in the eurozone. Um, we've had an Israel office now for for more than fifteen years, and some of those investments have have been in, in Europe out of there too. So uh, I just think it's really hard to ignore a region that you know I think in the euro in the continental European zone is something like three hundred forty million people, uh, another sixty seven million or so in the UK, um, in aggregate, that is more than we have in the US. The economic growth isn't there, as Thomas said, but the spending power is and the consequence and that that's a critical mass of, of people. It's, it's, this, it's the same size and scale as some regions like Southeast Asia and Latin America, like you know, Brazil is you know, about 220 million people. And so it, you certainly can't ignore it. And the, and the question is more like, okay, well, if everyone has the same basic needs and wants, how are those needs and wants served? And, and what kind of companies can you build there that solve some of these problems? Because one way to think about it is what Thomas said, well, it's tax policy or it's regulatory change or it's cultural changes. There's also companies and companies can change things significantly. I mean, Amazon and Netflix have completely changed how um, and, and, and Facebook have, have changed a lot about U.S. society. And I think when you start to have businesses that can truly extend across the region, and help improve people's lives by providing products and services they want, you can actually change things and you can show the example for how other people can do it. I think it just so happens that if you look at most of the investment community in Europe, and this is, I guess, where, where I'll be a little critical. If you go back 10, 15 years ago, most of the investors in Europe probably had more of a you know, traditional banking, private equity kind of background, and probably had a little bit of that conservatism. And Thomas, and you're, you know, you may have felt this in, in other businesses, or you may have friends who have felt this, but they're just like, less sort of pushing to really go for it. Whereas nowadays, with 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 folks like Lightspeed, you know, which is a global firm, partners all over the world, we're trying to take that Silicon Valley mentality and inject it in, in, into every region. And it turns out we can find some people like Thomas who really do want to go for it. And a few of them will, will build significant businesses and those businesses will set the foundation. So I would just encourage you to ask the question 10 years from now. <laughs> now is a hard time to ask the question. But I also think there's a number of companies, that, some of which we're in, some of which others are in. They're actually defining what the European future is going to look like. Can I ask you, Thomas, from your experience, do you find the European versus the US venture product very different? Yes, it's like, it's like it's day and night. Like, if you look what kind of like seed stage term sheets get to the table of like people I know building companies and they get like in these small markets that in Europe, what it's like financial rape. And it does a lot of damage. It's, it does a lot of damage because your first term sheet in your seed or in your series A is like absolute rape. Then who's going to step in after that? You just handicap the company. So, and I think, you know, I really learned what are qualities VCs by working with Lightspeed, Axel, Insight, all these companies, all these investors that we have are like of a breed that is high, high quality. And then later I learned about what's happening you know, underground in the Netherlands, Lithuania, and you look at those terms, and you're like, you should have never agreed to this. And but the founders are also not aware of what's possible. So I think 
There is a break on it, by there because do, do, there's not. Okay, so I'm just going on script here, but on those founders that like you know they didn't know what's possible. I don't think that's really good enough. If you think that the core job of a CEO is to finance their business and to keep cash day zero yeah. being further and further away, and with the democratization and transparency of VC knowledge, Alex's of the world, amazing VCs from the US joining me on podcasts. You go onto Apple Podcasts and search VC. You can listen to two thousand amazing VCs I've had on the show. Listen, not knowing. I don't think it's a good excuse to be honest anymore. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. But imagine like young 19, 20 year old person spending 110% of his time building that company. And then somebody comes to him, is very, very nice, very polite, puts a term sheet on the table, talks about how it's done, puts a big check in front of your eyes that looks big at that point in time, 100,000 euros. And then you're like, let's go. And yeah, obviously that's not the best thing to do. But like, you know, people are people. Like it's an emotional thing as well. I get that. Yeah. The bird in the the bird in the hand is a, is a is a powerful thing. When you've come from a place where there's not a lot of innovation, like you're the first, you know, Estonian or Lithuanian, you know, startup entrepreneur, and you don't know anyone else who's ever built a company before. And yeah, maybe I'd listen to the twenty VC podcasts and I hear from all these great investors and operators. But like that doesn't feel real to me. And here's someone sitting across the table from me willing to give me a hundred thousand dollars to do to build my dream. It's a little it's it's a theoretical benefit, but here's a real thing that's that's sitting in front of me. And and it's not just in Europe. I mean, we hear this in Latin America, we've heard this in Southeast Asia. You know, it, it's a repeated thing because the people who tend to finance things are not that are not like there's not Silicon Valley is weird. Silicon Valley has this like weird risk loving kind of culture. And and we also know that it's a repeat game. We know that we're going to be playing the game with these people for decades. And so we got to treat everyone right. And so it's, it's a, it's a very unique thing. But the good news is the arrow, the directionality is going towards the vision, Harry, that I think you've, you've, you've espoused. Can I ask you, Thomas, when we think about the teams themselves, often people you know, say that it's harder to get the talent. I do want to touch on before we do a quick fire, just some conventional wisdoms that a lot of people are like, yes, we're all aligned. And VCs love this, too, because we're you know largely sheep. Um, but, you know, one of them is the rule of 40 is the new black. Uh, yes. And you've said before that this is maybe uh, BS. Why is the rule of 40 is the new black? Maybe BS. And how do you think about that? Like when you're evaluating a business, and I'm, I'm not a VC, but when, when you're doing that, it's, it's really about the fundamentals. And, and practically those fundamentals come down in how fast can you recycle cash to get that machine growing. And obviously, if you at a certain point in time, make a scatter plot and you put like a high growth ratio and a high profitability ratio, then you get the best companies. If you make that tighter, you, you, you get them better. So at least you get a good selection with a high uh, density of good companies, right? So, but that then saying that that is a causal rule that drives to create big companies, that's absolute bullshit. Because I can have a company that is actually declining while I'm milking out a lot of cash and I will get to a rule of 40, but obviously that is not a good company. And what I've seen over the last period of time, so a year ago or something like that, this rule 40 started to pop up in our board meeting. I was like, okay, rule 40, how? Ah, okay, that kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, I get it. But then all of a sudden this whole investor community thinks that it's kind of like a physics law and start to apply it in a way that it's nonsensical anymore. So, so, so I think that that's like, I, I'm so surprised by that, how I then meet young venture capitalists completely going gun ho on this and not understanding the fundamentals that are behind it anymore. And, and, and that's something that really surprises me. Like how can these communities of like mega talented, mega smart people, all of a sudden as a herd just go one thing and only talk about rule of 40 anymore. It's because they, 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 they like listen to an all in podcast and David Sachs says something and they're like, ah, there we go. Yeah, That's it, one. I, I, I don't know. Oh, I mean, as, as Vinted, we're beautifully happy with this development in the VC world because we, we do very well by that rule. But like it's yeah, it, it makes you wonder, right? It's it, it's a it's a I, I think a lot of um, there, there are these dangers with these frameworks that you confuse output metrics with input metrics. Mm. Exactly. And rule, rule of 40 is an output metric. It's like, I did a bunch of things and, and the business spits out this number and it happens that you add the revenue growth to the EBITDA margin and they happen to add to 40%. And then what a very smart public analyst, equity analyst realized is that if you correlate that 
with the multiples, prevailing multiples in the market, there is a much higher correlation with that than with raw growth, which was what it was during the zero interest rate era. And so that's why it started popping up more. It's because that correlation started to, to, to go up. And, and that still persists to today. That's, that's, if you look at companies that are trading at 10 times revenues, they, they tend to have rule of 40 or more. But it, to Thomas's point, it, for operators, it's, it's kind of irrelevant because they're doing, they're working on the input metrics. They're working on the things that define that efficient frontier of investment. And they're trying to think like, I have this balance sheet. I have my management team. I have my own bandwidth. What is sort of the value maximizing set of activities I can do with all those resources? And, and then like, the growth will 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 come, you know, if you, if you do those things. The last thing I'll say on the rule of forty is actually I actually think it's a it's a useful output metric. So it is an output metric, but it is a useful output metric if you use it that way. It's really hard to boil down the sort of vast majority of public companies into like one number. And this notion that you can balance growth and profitability is actually, I think, a really useful concept, and it's driven a lot of really, I think, good discussions about what that trade off is. But ruthlessly just focusing on one metric is never the right way to run a business. And you always have to be cognizant of like what's input and what's output. Yeah, exactly. So if you are in a board meeting and you decide that you're going to optimize the company towards rule of 40, then you're doing really stupid shit. Like, like that's just dumb. You should work from the input metrics where you say like, I'm going to make these investments because it's going to generate this type of cash flow in the future. And yes, in the future, I will have healthy growth and profitability. Fine. Like, but not optimize directly towards that. See it as an output in the future. But like, yeah, it's dangerous to do this. Can I ask another one that you said was uh, maybe a little bit of a conventional wisdom that needs to be debunked? EBITDA margin optimization. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That says it all, Thomas. You go for it, my friend. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, look. Again, an output metric, and it's not something that actually fundamentally matters. Like, what do you want to have rather? A business that does 100 million of free cash flow at 5% or let's say 10%, or do you want to have a business that does uh, 5 million of free cash flow at 70%? 70% EBITDA margin says nothing. It's about the absolute amount of EBITDA or free cash flow. Like a business is valued on money. More money that comes freely out of it is better. Doesn't matter under which ratio that money comes out there. And we've been looking at Excel files so much that we've seen very great companies with high EBITDA margin, but it doesn't mean that it by itself is a good thing. The only thing that matters is the absolute amount of cash flow that comes out of it. Alex, how do you think about that when investing today and analyzing new companies, trying to understand where it EBITDA margins can go to? Well, you know, <laughs> the, usually the highest EBITDA margin businesses have the lowest growth, right? And so it's this kind of funny thing where, um, you know, the business, like eBay has a great EBITDA margin. It hasn't really, it's not really growing. And it's kind of losing market share every single year to other companies like Vinted that are doing more innovative, you know, things. And and, and it's been it's become a real problem for them. And so, but, but what we do think about is, okay, we have to underwrite this business to some outcome. That outcome is more likely actually to be, and the enterprise value is going to be determined more by the EBITDA profile of the business over the very, very long term. So is there an inherent, um, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure that we think will yield a, a certain EBITDA margin over a certain percentage if the business you know, chooses to do that and flow cash. And so we have certain businesses we invest in. We invest in a lot of software businesses at the application layer. We invest in a lot of infrastructure software businesses, security businesses, marketplaces, social media, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in each of those cases, there is a best-in-class company that has best-in-class EBITDA margins. And so you go like in marketplaces, like, is this business potentially like an Airbnb? Like, like if you when you look at the the characteristics of that business, they don't take inventory. They just kind of do payments and trust and safety. But you know the gross margin line, it's a fairly light lift. And then they have a huge marketing advantage relative to other people in travel. They spend something like eighteen percent of revenues on marketing, whereas bookings and Expedia spend thirty percent. And that's because they have unique inventory. And so. You, you take an example like that and you go, well, we can replicate that in this other industry like apparel or home goods. 
well, maybe we can have that EBITDA profile because the fundamentals of the business are not that that different. And so you use these kind of like rules of thumb and look at best in class, and then you project forward what the business would trade at at a reasonable multiple of that EBITDA, and that's how you understand your underwrite. But it's it's a it's a little bit of a triangulation exercise, um, and you're playing for best in class. But just because you have a high margin doesn't mean it's a great business. It could be yeah. a shrinking business uh, and, at a high margin. And and I think like. Let's be honest about it, right? If you have a very good big margin, it's nice, brings a lot of safety. But like people feel, let's say, that the high margin is the safety thing. But if the absolute number is not big, it doesn't bring any safety, doesn't bring any real value. So it's it, like it really needs to be seen in context of the absolute value. Otherwise, it's just and, a reason. And, yeah. And, and it also could be could be an opportunity for someone else to come in and undercut you, too. I mean, I think that's the main thing. Like what I actually think is a better framework than margin is like, what's your return on equity? Like what is your when you make one hundred million dollars of investment, you know, in the coming year? Well, what do we expect the return on that hundred million dollars to be over the ensuing five years? And that's a hard thing to calculate. But, you know, if you can be really good at a company at deploying capital and seeking an equity return on that capital, I mean, that's how you compound for 40, 50 years. And so if you if you say to me, well, look, we're going to make this investment, but it's going to actually lower our EBITDA margin, I'd say, well, how much EBIT, how many EBITDA euros or dollars do you think it's going to add to the business relative to the investment we're making? That's the thing that really matters. Yeah. And I mean, look at the, look at the most successful companies, Costco. Like the one thing they did is they kept that margin low. And thereby, they kept on winning and kept on going. So it's really in context of everything else. You should never say an industry should have this margin or it's dangerous. And you, you can actually kill an industry with it by adopting that. Do you worry about going public because of the education that would ensue for retail investors for the street to understand the nuances of what we said there, to understand some other nuances of the business, which aren't as obvious to everyone else as they are to someone like us. I think when we go public and and it's the same as when now talking to venture capitalists, your numbers needs to be obviously clear on that it's working. Like it needs to be obvious. And and I think if it's not, then you can be lucky that you raise around at a good valuation, but it needs to be razor sharp on like how you're converting cash into future cash flows and how you are growing your business and how you're building defensibility. And I think I'm not worried about it because every time I talk to somebody about Vinted that they didn't know our financials, they were, they were very skeptical about it secondhand, who's buying secondhand, is this ever going to be a business? And then you show the financials and they're like, holy crap, how many people are doing this? And, and so, so I think like you need to be very specific to be able to explain how you gonna create value and 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 yeah, so 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 I'm not worried about it. I think it will be the same game as in private. So I want to do a quick fire round. So I say a short statement and then you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? I Thomas, do it. Thomas, who's your biggest competitor to you? Co biggest competitor to Vinted. Yeah. Um I think it's um Adavinta. Okay. Alex, what's Thomas's biggest strength and what's his biggest weakness? Be honest. Be honest? Um, yes. He's so, too hardworking. <laughs> he's, hard, he's too good looking. Um, no, uh, I, I would say Thomas is an incredible systems thinker and incredible um, measure, like measured integration of quantitative and qualitative insight. He can, he's, uh, can zoom in and then zoom out and zoom in and zoom out. And I think it's a quality a lot of great CEOs have um, in space. He sweats the details, but he also cares about, a lot about the big picture. I think we, we've talked about like some of the sort of European conservatism, right? Like I think, um, and, and sort of the fear of failure, you know, and, and I think a lot of that just comes from kind of the conditions for which, you know, uh, Thomas and other CEOs in Europe have grown up. And I think one of the things I've enjoyed working with, with Thomas is just helping him think about the big, yeah. the big picture and how we see the global market and like what Vinted can become in the future. And, um, you know, I, I, I've seen his thinking even over the last few years, confidence grow as we've talked about those things. I, I think you're honest about it. And I think it, it's really a weakness of, 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 of me and like, and, and Ad, Alex has really helped with that and the other investors as well, but it, it, it really helped, but it's hard, you know, to think as confidently as the Silicon Valley people, because there, you don't have all these examples around you. And, and you see those people who build those companies in Silicon Valley as kind of like half gods that don't exist. 
in a regular <laughs> world. Like, so you, yeah. And then you meet them and you realize they're fucking socially awkward and quite <laughs> small and really not very good looking. Well, but Harry, I mean, Harry, like, I mean, like, this is my quick fire for you. I mean, you've met a lot of these people. Like, how, how is your expect is your expectation met with reality? Like for these people, like, what have you learned for, for, on, on that on that front? I mean, there's there's the question of like presence and aura um, versus knowledge. Honestly, socially and um, presence wise very as thomas says we we idolize them in many respects yeah. these are the gods in the valley that we look up to and then you meet them and you realize they're just people obviously but yeah. they're also a little bit more awkward a little bit less comfortable they don't speak with such confidence and it's often in a social situation they struggle more but yeah for sure i think you know strategically you know as impressive as one would expect bluntly mm -hmm. uh, i think what worries me honestly and this being very candid vcs have got beget got better than founders at telling stories that mm. worry vcs mm -hmm. are better guests than founders on the show mm. generally speaking because we have to mm. sell cash so we have to be fucking great salespeople. <laughs> such an interesting statement it's a, it's a really yeah. but and, and that's a worry for me mm. um tell me thomas what does the second hand marketplace resale market transform into in the next five to ten years it's going to be an amazon but then for second hand so it's going to be all the ease and all the, you know, sophistication uh, is going to go into the secondary market as much as it's gone into the first market. So I think we've seen over the last two decades, we've seen how e-commerce has been optimized by players like Amazon and now Timu and, and Shine coming in again. It's like incredibly smart people building systems that work very, very well to, to bring things to, to consumers. And I think we're going to see that now in the secondary market. Alex, what's the biggest disparity of opinion the board have had across topics? I mean, the U.S. The U.S. was a is was a big one. I mean, I don't know, Thomas. Can I can I talk about at a high level? Like, sure. I sure. I mean, we've we've seen a lot of success in Europe, and I think we've gone from being like you know having like oh maybe it worked in France, maybe it's going to work in these other places to to feeling actually really confident that we figure out a playbook that works and it's a different model is we're the only ones who really do the model that we do. And so the natural next step is like, well, why shouldn't this work in the US? And we've debated this a lot. There's some element of that that is just management time and attention. It's like, what, Europe isn't big enough? Like, why wouldn't we just focus on, on Europe and make Europe really successful? On the other hand, the U.S. is a massive, massive market, and um, the model that we do hasn't been tried there. But I think that tension exists for for a reason. You can only do so many things well, and the CEO's I mean, attention is is the is the bandwidth constraint. And, and I think actually forget about one, and that's like 2021. We're building these board budgets, and uh, this was kind of like before all the shit hits the van. And we made a board budget actually, and it's related to that, but I, me and my team made, made a board budget that was like with a massive burn again. And then the board was like, ho, 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 ho. And we had people stepping in saying, look, Thomas, the market is super tense now, probably shit is gonna hit the van, da, 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 da. And we have many of these discussions, high friction. And actually out of that came that we completely reworked the budget and like obviously luck there, but like shit hit the van, macro collapsed, everything went wrong. And we just sailed into like a financial sustainable position instead of like going into one of our biggest burns that we would ever do. So I think we had actually, and we have many of these things time to time where there's real friction in the board. I get real pushback, but then out of that comes better decisions. So, so I, I don't know, we had that with the board budget, we had it with US, we had it with going into shipping, we had it with going into luxury, like many mm. times, man, that we, we go head to head and that, that there needs to be really good explanations on why we do something or not. If you could both change one thing about the vintage business, what would it be today? Thomas, you should Alex, go first. Don't, Alex, don't say the CEO. That's a classic <laughs> VC. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could just like speed up time. I just feel like I just wanted to go faster. I, I wish we could do more. What do you uh, want to go faster? Expansion to go faster? Like yeah, just demand? like... Yeah, I wish we could just have higher productivity, like less people, higher productivity so that we can put the same people now, do more things. Like, I don't know. I'm really excited about all the stuff that's happening with AI. I really hope that we can find more productivity. It's just things become more complex with more people, more opinions, more people. Like, I, 
you know, I wish we could run it with less people. And then we can do more with the same people that we have. Alex, what would yours be? I, I kind of was thinking this, the same the same thing, um, but but I'm like less critical of the current state <laughs> because I actually think our velocity is is actually pretty good. It can always be better. I think that one of the challenges we have organizationally is that we have business units now. We've shifted into a model where there are you know we have a few different businesses that are operating and. You know, it's it's just a different velocity that you can expect when that happens, and different level of visibility. Um, but the good news is that you know, I I think we've we've shown that through M and A and some other things, we've been able to accelerate those and and get the bootstrapping off the ground. And so I I I would probably say the same thing, but I'd probably be less critical about the current state. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, think Tom, I, think Tom, I think Thomas is the most the biggest critic of, his, of himself. I don't need to criticize him. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just you see all these vectors of growth, all these things. I just I would love I would love to see how that I would love to see faster how that works and like I, I don't know. I always find a commonality of the best founders and CEOs, Alex. I'm sure you find this. It's like they never pitch the good. They're always like, oh, this is shit. This is shit. We could do this better. We could do this better. And I'm like, huh, this one's good. You know, you know, the line from Hamilton, from Hamilton, where they, they, they describe him as he's never satisfied. Like, I, yeah, I, okay. I, let, let I be... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I, I just, I just find that the founders I work with that I admire the most or CEOs in cases where they're not technically founders. They're not. They're heavily dissatisfied with the status quo, no matter how good, objectively good the status quo is. Yeah, and, let me. Let and me that's an authentic. Very... That's authentic. It's not put on. It's like like they're they're like really really it bothers them. You know. Yeah, but let me be very clear. Like I am incredibly grateful for the team and how fast they're working. They're, they're exceptional. <laughs> it makes me sound yeah. like I'm not happy with what they're doing. I, they're they're doing stuff I'm absolutely unable to do. Like Adam V, my team. It's, it's just incredible people, but. Okay, final one for you both. Vinted in ten years' time, where is it? You can put, you can say where it is, and then you've got to put an enterprise value number on it. Uh, how many years you said? Ten. Ten. And years. whoever wins, I'm gonna buy the most amazing dinner for in London. Okay, 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 okay. I'm gonna in ten years. Mm -hmm. Ten years. So that's twenty. No, that's. Uh... 20, 30, th four. Yeah, yeah. 30, what was vintage latest price? So the last one is was during COVID was a 3.75. 3.75 billion. Okay. Let's do this. 10 years, boys. So 50 billion um, global platform, um, fully integrated shipping and payment functionalities across every category, Amazon like. Uh, marketplace dynamics across all categories, um, plus new software solution businesses next to it. Look, I think if you if you achieve what Thomas described, right? There's only a few companies in the world that can that can say that. You know, you have Alibaba in China, or what it kind of used to be before the recent changes. You have Mercado Libre in Latin America. You have you know C in Southeast Asia. I mean, what we're talking about is is a re, like the regionally dominant peer to peer marketplace business and all the things that come with that in terms of the next set of businesses and not just doing it in fashion, but doing it across essentially every category of commerce. That feels like a very valuable business to me. I don't know what the number is going to be, but it's probably at least as valuable as those companies. Yeah, you've got to put a number on it. I need a dinner bet. All right. I'm going to I'm going to lowball you because I don't want to lose the bet, uh, okay. but I'm going to say 40 billion. Yeah, yeah, forty fifty. I'll be happy with that. Does that feel does that feel right? Yeah, yeah. But we have to, right? I mean, we have we have actually with Vint is an opportunity to build a valuable company in Europe. If we screw this up, like it's like it's like it's just depressing if we don't, I think. It's really Thomas, depressing if we don't. Thomas, you are my hero. We didn't know each other before this, but I, I love the honesty, the transparency. You're great because you, you speak like an American in terms of your opinions, your uh, not being afraid to share how you think. But then you also just have this like incredible humility, respectfully, Alex, that Americans don't tend to have. Uh, mm. It's just so refreshing. And then, Alex, you're just a pro. I, I love this. So thank you both for doing this. I've so enjoyed it. That's nice, man. Thank I you, felt Harry. Really, uh, felt really at home here. So you made me feel very comfortable. So I guess that's why, uh, I, uh, I, yeah, that's why it came so easy. Thanks a lot, man. It was very nice.